Hi, my name is Jacqueline Gibson, and this talk is titled For Us Without Us, Addressing Tech's Shortcomings in Creating Equity for Black People. So let's get into this topic. So many people laud technology as the great equalizer, and that's because it bridges gaps between ability and knowledge and allows people to achieve what was previously considered to be impossible. And ultimately, this advent of the digital age has seemingly made education and upward mobility portable and more accessible to people of all backgrounds and abilities. And these benefits are what drew me to pursue a career in tech. So a bit about me. I'm a software engineer who hails from Texas, and I fell in love with technology precisely because I wanted to be able to leverage tech to solve some of society's most pressing issues. And that was the ultimate factor in my decision to pursue computer science for my undergraduate degree. That said, after my first few years in the tech space, it became evident that tech was not solving issues faced by many underrepresented groups, but especially not serving Black people at the same rates as other races. And for that reason, I began to study the intersection of technology and society in my academic research. I specifically focused on the ways the technology as we know it has maintained the prejudicial practices that limit the ways that we as Black people are able to navigate the world. What I found was that rather than living up to its role as a disruptive force, technology is enforcing societal norms exacerbating separations between individuals of different genders, races, abilities, and socioeconomic statuses. So instead of closing the gap between privilege, it tends to widen them instead. My hope is that by the end of this session, you will be able to clearly see the ways that anti-Blackness is replicated in technology and understand the discrepancies the digital divide has created for the Black community. But we won't end there we'll also discuss what each of us needs to do and able to push forward for a more equitable future for our people. So it's really my opinion that the treatment of Black people in relation to technology is derivative of the treatment of Black people in society at large. A perpetual underclass, it's no surprise that Black individuals have not benefited from the technical boom at the same rates as their non-Black counterparts. Yet, when you try to consider the role that Black people's lack of ascribed humanity plays in their position in the digital world, we're forced to view the issue of technical isolation in a different light. Let's consider the work of scholar Sylvia Winter, who in No Humans Involved discusses the effects of the Los Angeles Police Department using the No Humans Involved or NHI label in cases involving Black youth. This is a conceptual othering of Black individuals and their lives. And she writes that it makes it easier to judicially lynch those who have been made perceivable as less than human. Taking this a step further, being perceived as non-human makes it easier for individuals to justify other forms of violence that Black individuals have been forced to survive since we arrived in 1619. With this in mind, it became clear that the reasons that Black people are continuously exploited, both in the physical and the digital, are the same. It's because there are no serious repercussions for discrimination directed towards the non-human. This idea of being categorized as less than human brings to mind the concept of thingification or the categorization of bodies as items rather than humans. Martinetian scholar Amy Césaire holds that colonization and thingification are synonymous. Thingification involves this destruction of entire societies and their histories solely for the purpose of exploitation and domination. So really, the stripping of humanity that occurs to Black individuals represents a systematic decision to strip us of our personhood. This is why it's important to note the role of the hegemony or the tendency of groups and powers to work to maintain their dominance plays in the current state of technology. Traditionally, we see white, cisgender, heterosexual men shaping the ideas and knowledge and intelligence that we value in society. And when you look at the tech spaces, there really is no difference here. And while people will argue that the internet and cyberspace and really just the digital entities represent a place for anyone to be able to be anything, 
the tech industry has somehow still become synonymous with these same identities of privilege that I listed before. This means that the creators of technical systems are also the same people who hold power in greater society. These individuals have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo because their power is intrinsically linked to doing so. You see the repercussions of this, not only in the way that technology is developed. So thinking about the development teams that are assembled, who serves on these teams, the design processes they use, but also in the problems that these professionals choose to elevate in terms of priority and ultimately to solve. At the end of the day, it's in the best interest of forces of hegemony to continue the thingification of black individuals. If black people are considered to be things, it's easier to exclude us from the creation process because at the end of the day, people create technologies to serve the needs and wants of other people, not inanimate objects. Objects exist to be leveraged to accomplish the goals of mankind. But if mankind is overwhelmingly considered to be synonymous with white, heterosexual, cisgender, and male, and that's what we consider to be the definitions of personhood, what then happens to those of us who don't hold these labels? When it comes to really thinking about the creation of technology, right? And thinking about um, how black people relate to this process. If you look back at it, you can see throughout history and all the way to the present day, black people have been excluded. And when they are considered, it's usually as an afterthought. While we have often had technology used upon us, or even been the technology ourselves, we rarely have technology created for us with us in mind. Take, for example, our relationship to film, specifically focusing on photography. Originally, lighting for calibration for photographs was based on lighter white skin. Despite major photography companies selling their products as cutting edge technology of the highest quality, black people continue to experience discoloration whenever they had photos taken. It really wasn't until the 1970s that Kodak attempted to address the issue of capturing darker colors. When you look at the motivations behind this decision, it was actually motivated by a desire to photograph dark objects, such as chocolate, mahogany furniture, or horses, not responding to the needs of the Black consumer. This really just goes to show that when systems are not equitable, there is no way to prevent the insidious effects of white supremacy from being reproduced in the technologies that we see. This is further exacerbated by the fact that Black individuals are not provided opportunities to shape product development at the same race as their non-Black counterparts. In the tech field, you'll see this issue between the lack of people, Black people specifically in the industry, and even less Black people working in technical roles, so shaping and building the products that these companies are releasing. Let's take a look at Google. In 2018, they reported that approximately 2.5% of their total employee pool and 2% of their new hire class identified as Black. Black employees also were reported to have the highest attrition rate of any of the marginalized ethnic identities that were tracked in this report. If we shift our focus to Microsoft, a company which many people consider to be the current vanguard of the responsible tech era, you look at their 2019 diversity and inclusion numbers, you'll see that Black employees only made up 3.3% of technical roles and 7.5% of non-technical roles. By looking at these figures, you can see that the continued isolation of Black people from active creation of technology is playing a major role in our exclusion from benefiting for digital advancements. Because we don't have a say in creating the technology that decides how we navigate the digital world. How can we exert agency in this space? The answer is that we can't. Moving forward, I think it's important that we look at the continued integration of society with technology and how that's resulted in this concept known as the digital divide. And that is a phenomenon that shapes the way that tech is developed, used, and shared. Through the separation of the world into two groups, those who are digitally adept and those who are digitally inept, the latter find themselves too categorized to be as an underclass in society. Black individuals on average tend to have less technical access and skills than their white counterparts. And so the separation created between the two classes is further amplified when race is taken into consideration. 
The phenomenon of the digital divide is affecting Black people's interactions with technology at all levels. It's not only shaping their ability to use technology daily, but their chance to create it for themselves. Another thing that's important to realize is that a lot of conversations about the digital divide focus on questions of access. So do people have internet at home? Do they have smartphones? What kind of connectivity do they have? And while access is a huge problem when it comes to discussing the divide, it's not the only factor. I personally argue in favor of an expanded definition that takes into consideration differences not only in access, but, but also in digital and algorithmic literacy. It's more than just really opening a door and getting technical tools into the hands of marginalized groups. These are what access-centered solutions would have us do. Simply having the tools in your hands, though, does not necessarily mean that you will know how to use those tools or even understand how these systems are functioning. And this is where the idea of literacy comes into play. Digital literacy is defined as a person's ability to perform tasks effectively in a digital environment. And in addition to those tasks, it's their ability to evaluate and apply new knowledge that they've gained from those digital environments. And so when we look at the Black community, the lack of access to tech, in addition to a lack of resources to develop these necessary skills that are critical for digital literacy, those continue to contribute to the technical disempowerment we're seeing affecting the Black community. But we should take it a step further because many individuals in society, regardless of race, suffer from algorithmic illiteracy. And algorithmic illiteracy is a dangerous position as we continue to rely more and more on programs to govern our lives. When we try to define what algorithmic literacy is, that is known as the knowledge of technical aspects and the ability to critique computer programming codes that underlies these systems. And when you think about that, you realize it's just as important as access and the ability to use the tools. That's because those who understand technology have been able to leverage their knowledge to gain and maintain power. And the ability to understand the workings of a system, as opposed to simply being able to use it or have it used for you, that is what distinguishes creators from others. So if we're truly going to be able to have a conversation about the contemporary state of Blackness and technology, we need to pull the curtain back and analyze the historical context that resulted in the current state of affairs. Too often when we have these conversations about the digital divide, people will view the Black community from a deficit perspective. And that is to say that they will fault Black individuals for, by citing their perceived shortcomings. So Black people are more likely to be digitally illiterate because we lack the natural skill. We don't know how to code. We don't have access to the internet at the same rates and we don't have the disposable wealth on average to afford private coding tutors for our kids. And I want to say that people will choose to focus on this deficit rather than really try to acknowledge the societal factors that put us in these situations in the first place. And I really want to be clear on this because I'm not saying that these questions and these side obstacles should be ignored because all the problems I mentioned as quote unquote shortcomings are active issues that we need to work to fix if we're going to move towards a more equitable future. But trying to solve these problems without considering the greater societal forces at play results in fixes that are the metaphorical equivalent of placing a bandaid on a bullet wound. So really these questions of who has the access, who has these skills, who has the understanding, this is all influenced by the role of power in society. The hegemonic forces of our society shape the disproportion that fuels the digital divide, and these forces are undoubtedly related to socioeconomic issues. At the end of the day, technology is a tool, and keeping a monopoly on who can use this tool and who can profit from it is the way for those in power to maintain their hold on society. But knowing how the, the different ways these technologies function, how to use that to your advantage, that is how we can break free. So to wrap all of this up, the most important aspect of algorithmic literacy is understanding the limitations of algorithms and technology in general and being able to critique them by knowing how they function under the hood. So 
really the problem of algorithmic literacy is not something that just we as Black people need as, as a group, as a community to navigate tech properly on a daily basis, but it's something that we need entrenched on a societal level to prevent our continued disenfranchisement at the hands of the powers of be, especially when those powers choose to rely on technology they don't fully understand. On that note, I would like to highlight this one case study here, which is Beware Software being used in Fresno. So the creators of Beware Software leveraged the mounting fear about um, dangers to police officers' light, uh, lives excuse me, in the wake of the Ferguson and similar protest. Despite these risks being at a historic low, the city still purchased the software because their fears were being leveraged by the creators of Beware. And they chose to use the software to be able to determine the risk to officers when they're in the line of duty. But when the time came for Beware to be more closely examined, it became clear that those who had purchased it and cleared the purchase and were working in law enforcement never understood how this worked. And when they asked the vendors, they withheld all of the information about what was going on to the algorithm. How were the rates of risk calculated? All of this information is trade secrets and proprietary data. And when this became clear to the city council, they had no choice but to vote not to approve the continued use of Beware. So this case is alarming, not only because of the demonstrated importance of algorithmic literacy and knowing how tech works, but it also demonstrates how easily people are willing to rely on objective software without knowing what it actually can and cannot do. Another important example was a study conducted by the Human Rights Data Analysis Group, which surrounded uh, police departments in the Oakland area that were using a specific predictive policing software known as PredPol. And the study exposed that these departments were highly concentrating their resources and time on two predominantly low income and non-white areas. And this occurred despite documentation that said that drug use was more equally spread across different communities and different backgrounds. And when they looked into this, they found that the reason these police departments were using this was because PredPol's model was reinforcing existing patterns that came from historical police data. And by training off of the arrest reports and other police documentation from the 20th century, where racial biases had not been unchecked, had not been checked, excuse me, and higher police interactions in communities of color were occurring, Predpol essentially created a self-fulfilling prophecy that resulted in these communities being viewed as high risk and thus continuing to experience higher drug arrest rates. And this shows really that no matter how impartial we might consider an algorithm to be, if the data on which it is trained is flawed, it will also reflect these biases. So understanding this helps us move our conversations away from focusing on bemoaning seemingly isolated technical failings and instead looking to highlight deeper systemic issues. Because algorithms can reinforce past discriminatory practices and moving away from that is vital in being able to create a more equitable reality. For this reason, it's really crucial for Blackness to be centered in technical development, because when technical technologies really fail to work for Black people, it's not only frustrating, but it's representative of a larger issue. In her book, Dark Matters, Dr. Simone Brown presents the idea that a main purpose of several forms of technology is to detect wh whether or not a person is present. So when technologies fail to recognize Black people, they are effectively saying that Black bodies are not there. And if they are there, that they don't matter. Indifference to the Black experience in technical development is not really a step forward from active discrimination, even though some would have you to think that. It's really just the same discrimination repackaged. And attempting to remove race from the equation erases the potential for equity in evaluation. So there are several steps, really, that the technology industry can take to move forward from the lack of representation. The first is reframing perspectives of technical creators. When it comes to utilizing classifiers and predictive algorithms, we need to ask the teams creating these softwares to, <clears throat> excuse me, the following question. How will the increased reliance on predictive analysis continue disenfranchisement of Black individuals? 
Creators need to account for the fact that relying on historical data does a disservice to our community because it's replicating current social biases in seemingly impartial systems that people will then trust and not check the bias of. We need to consider what it would look like to center Blackness in the development of these types of softwares. What really would an equitable and fair algorithm that is predictive in nature look like? Personally, I think this means the end of really trying to apply algorithms for law enforcement and predictive policing. So moving away from these surveillance heavy and recidivism prediction instruments, but instead looking to employ these algorithms to generate rehabilitative sentencing and treatment options for previously criminalized behavior. This is extremely timely now because we are having so many conversations about prison and policing abolition. And this is really the time to consider what we have to use technology for in order to reinforce safer and sustainable um, really programs and initiatives for our communities. Additionally, what we need to do, whatever we do, is ensure that these companies are issuing actual, like actually addressing the issues at hand. So pulling from popular culture, which if you know me is something that I love to do. In this one better off TED episode titled Racial Sensitivity, the company the characters work at is forced to grapple with the fact that their motion sensors cannot detect darker skin. And thus none of the black employees can actually navigate the office. When the executives are confronted by the black employees for discrimination and racism, they reply that it's not really truly targeting black people, it's just ignoring them. And the worst people can call it is indifferent. And rather than fix the sensors, they opt to give each black employee their own personal white guy who is tasked with following that individual everywhere and activating sensors on their behalf. And so while this is a humorous take on not taking the uh, concerns of black consumers seriously, this episode underscores the fact that there are major issues that result from excluding black people from creation and also refusing to acknowledge their concerns with seriousness and not really admitting to creating permanent fixes. And ultimately this brings me to my third point, which is why it's extremely important that we carve a space intentionally for black individuals in this world of technology creation. It's not enough for there simply to be black individuals in these companies or a sprinkling of black engineers or product designers. It's also not enough that ads sometimes feature black consumers and that sometimes there's support for these coding camps for black students. Without conscious creation and freedom of expression, these solutions are simply tools by which white supremacy is reinforced. They opt for tokenism or quick fixes, rather than addressing the vast inequality that exists in the digital world. Our society lacks equity, and until we do something about it, so will our technology. So in closing, it's important that we all recognize technology at the end of the day is just a tool and it can be used for good and to push for equity. But right now, black people do not control the tools and we're at an impasse regarding our ability to leverage technology in ways that are progressive, liberating, and most importantly, challenge current systems domination in society. We need to really think about these questions. For example, if we as a people do not have the same stake in technical creation, how can we ensure our community is able to leverage technology at the same level of our more privileged counterparts? Currently, the answer is that we can't. And since we can't do that, it's no wonder that so many technologies that we see today fail us because they're not proper checks and balances in place. And there's no way for society to properly prevent biases from permeating into these systems that are created by human beings who are flawed. And as a result, the relationship that Black people have with technology and technical spaces continues to mirror the position we have currently in society. This is why we need funding and support for accessible resources dedicated to both digital and algorithmic literacy education. This is why technical development teams need to be held accountable for failing to consider how Black lived experiences will be affected by their technology. This is why we should take advantage of society's current state and push forward conversations on how we can use technology to create equitable and safer futures for Black people everywhere. This is why it's increasingly important that we ensure the companies are actually addressing the issues at hand, not just releasing statements that support our existence without backing up their words with actions. Most importantly, this is why we need space for Black creators, developers, product managers, and founders. So the biggest question we face moving forward is whether or not digital spaces can serve as a platform for liberation. And I strongly believe the answer is yes. 
But this will only be accomplished if we remove important barriers to entry faced by all marginalized peoples who are trying to access these spaces. If we want to see technology achieve its goal of being the great equalizer, we need disruption. For disruption to properly occur, hegemony needs to be dismantled. And for hegemony to be properly dismantled, we need to ensure that decisions are made for us, by us. Thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed today's talk. Hopefully you were able to take away some great points and this can start some important discussions. Thank you.